Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the global stage for the airline session. And uh, we've got two cracking speakers to both entertain and inform you over the next hour. Now, my plan for this is that it's uh, a bit like one of those TV talk shows where you're going to have the opportunity as well to join in. So if at any stage you feel like you've got a point you want to make or you want to raise a question, please wave your hand up in the air. Somebody somewhere will have a microphone. And when ready, we'll jump into you. So just join in and do that. I think it's going to be great. Now, if you look at the two airlines we've got, you could argue that they are worlds apart, not just geographically, but actually in, in culture and the way an airline's run. But in many ways, our airline industry suffers from many of the same challenges. So we're going to be exploring some of the similarities as well as those differences. So let me start by welcoming to the stage the first of our pair of speakers this afternoon. The first is uh, Sanjay Kumar, who is Chief Commercial Officer of Indigo. Indigo is the largest of the Indian airlines by passengers carried and by its fleet size and has about 40% of the market. Now Sanjay's got more than 25 years experience in the aviation sector, having worked for Sahara Airlines in 1992, then Royal Airways, before coming part of the startup program for SpiceJet, where he became vice president for marketing and planning. He left to join Indigo, where for the past 10 years, he's developed the commercial operations of the Haraya-based airline. So would you please welcome to the stage Sanjay Kumar, please. Our second speaker is Jan Albrecht. He's the chief executive of Saudi Arabia's largest airline, the national carrier Saudia. Now, Jan, who holds both uh, dual Mexican and German citizenships, um, has spent 28 years with Mexicana Airlines before being appointed in 2001 as CEO of the Global Star Alliance, managing the growth of the alliance from 10 to 27 member airlines in 25 countries. Now, I know from doing some of these kind of jobs, trying to get two or three airlines to actually talk together is a challenge. God knows what it was like trying to get 25. Um, <coughs> he later spent four years in Vienna, managing a successful turnaround of Austrian Airlines as the CEO, before moving to become chief executive of Sun Express, um, Sun Express Turkey and Sun Express Germany, a joint venture low-cost leisure carrier of Turkish Airlines and Lufthansa. Since his move to Jeddah at the start of last year, the airline was voted as most improved at the Skytrax 2017 World Airline Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Jan Albrecht, CEO of Saudi. Thank you. Jan, let me start with you if let me start with you if I may. Most improved airline, how much of that was down to you? I fear to say <laughs> nothing. <laughs> no, uh, I guess very little. It's uh, the job really that was done by 16,000 employees of the airline. I joined Saudi beginning of 2017. We jumped on board a transformation program which had started already about a year and a half before me joining. So what we saw in uh, June last year of the most improved airline was really the merit of 16,000 people, was the merit of our DG who started this transformation program. Perhaps, yes, here and there we were able to twist in one or the other area, but it's really the merit of the 16,000 employees. Okay, we'll come on to some details of that in due course. But if I can take it, you've been more than 40 years, as we've said, in the industry. What made you want to get into aviation in the first place? Well, I started as a pilot. Uh, my dad was a pilot, so I think it was obvious, uh, the obvious way to go. So I started as a pilot, uh, very quickly moved into the management ranks, uh, flew for 20 years altogether, but uh, combined management with the uh, duties of flying planes. And uh, eventually I had to give up the cockpit. It was not compatible to have a long schedule in the office and then try to keep your license current. So I decided to go for management and here we are. Well done. Sanjay, 25 years in the business. How did you get into it? 
So basically, you know, uh, I started just out of college and uh, got into Sahara as a group. And uh, they thought of starting airline and they kind of put me into that position of uh, under training uh, with then project consultant. And that was the time when I got into the aviation for the first time. Otherwise, before that, I had never ever flown a plane. Uh, so that was quite a you know, change for me uh, from nowhere to get into airline business. And then slowly and gradually, over the last 25 years, learning the business from various aspects, uh, you know, working on the ground, working in the sales, marketing, and commercial, and network planning. It's been able to kind of uh, come up to the expectation of the you know, uh, management and uh, shareholders in a big way. So it's been a great journey for the last 25 years, personally, for me. And it is a, uh, an interesting business. I think when, once people get in, they, they tend not to come out. I was talking to a young lady with an airline yesterday who said, I, I was in this job for two years. I've now been 11. So it's... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I have personally gone through that uh, aspect. When I moved out of Sahara, we wanted to launch a two-class service called Royal Airways Limited. And then, of course, September 11th happened in the United States of America. And obviously, that led a lot of uh, uncertainty in the marketplace. So we had to look at uh, changing the business model from a full-service airline to a low-cost airline. And that was the time when we kind of realized that even if we wanted to work somewhere else, just we didn't feel like going out of the aviation business, despite the fact that airline was not up and running. And we were sitting most of the time in the ground and then just planning for the future. So that also gives us a lot of confidence that once you are in the airline business, you just don't want to do anything else but for the airline business. Yeah. But it's a business, and, and if we believe IATA, that doesn't make any money. And the average airline um, profits, I mean, the margins are, what, less than 4%? So why on earth does anybody stay in this market if you don't make money? So, I mean, we have seen uh, Indigo, uh, I've been working with Indigo for the last 12 years, and uh, out of 12 years, 10 years has been the continuous profitability of the business. So it's unfair to say that no airline will make money. Yes, out of 100 airlines, there will be one airline which will be making money and making good amount of money. And uh, it largely depends on your planning, your execution, and your kind of uh, attention to details in terms of every aspect of the cost and revenue, as well as customer experience. And that kind of gets you to that uh, stage where you continuously continue to deliver a high level of performance and uh, have a team to kind of manage those operations. So it's, it's, it's fair to say that out of 100 airlines, you know, 99 will not make money, one will at least make some money, and one will make some lot of money. Yeah. Okay. Um, could you just, for the, for the benefit of people who perhaps don't know Indigo, could you just give us an idea of the airline size? We've said the largest by fleet size, the, um, the largest really by the uh, number of passengers yeah. carried in so, India. So, you know, Indigo started its business in 2006, in August of 2006, and now this year of us will be completing 12 years of operation. In this 12 years of operation, we have grown our fleet to now 161 planes, uh, which is a combination of Airbus 320s and uh, 6 ATR. Uh, we are flying on a daily basis about 200,000 passengers a day. So that is the kind of scale and size we have grown to. We are operating more than 1,000 flights a day in the marketplace, domestic market as well as the international market. Uh, suffice to say that uh, over uh, last 11 years, we have kind of flown more than 200 million passengers. Our fleet size has grown to 161 planes today, and we are expecting a growth of about 20 to 25% year-on-year basis for ne next couple of years. Uh, you will see the India domestic market growing at about uh, over 20% for last three years. And Indigo has been the airline which has kind of brought in this growth in a massive way. Entire aviation in India in last five years on a you know, year-on-year basis has grown about 20% uh, and 85% of the growth has been brought in by Indigo. That is the kind of scale and the size we are talking about uh, by, by induction of uh, fleet and the frequencies in the key markets. We have been able to kind of uh, prove to the world that the low-cost airline model can sustain. And India being uh, a population of 1.2 billion people, and there are only 500 planes flying in the country. So you can imagine the kind of uh, long runway we have ahead of us in terms of managing this growth. We are quite bullish about the market. We think that it is a market for a long term. Next five to seven years, 10 years, we'll continue to see this growth uh, coming in a big way. And we will continue to deliver this growth in a big way going forward. Okay. Yeah, and if I could turn to you, and uh, 
Saudi. Uh, I mean, we've, we've talked about sleeping giants before. It was just before we came in today, one of your colleagues was talking about this thing. It's what we always say about it. It's one of the best kept secrets. Um, I think people visualize Saudi as being one of the small carriers somewhere in the Middle East, but it's not strictly true, is it? So give us an idea of the size of the fleet and market view. Mm. Well, uh, interesting comment, no? one uh, sleeping, sleeping giant. Uh, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, Saudi has a lot of potential. It's actually the reason that I decided when I was invited to, to come over to Jeddah, to Saudi Arabia, I decided to join the team because watching this from the outside, you saw that Saudi had glory days, perhaps two or three decades ago, but then it was kind of silent. And suddenly when I realized the, the plan, when I realized the seriousness of the transformation plan, the vision of the government in itself, the vision 2030, but then the uh, internal vision and the transformation plan in the early, which we call 2020, I realized this is the company to be, this is the country to be at this time. It's just fascinating after 15 months having lived in Jeddah and Saudi Arabia. It's a, a great place. It's going through massive transformation. The country is going through massive transformation. The women driving, the women attending uh, soccer games, uh, you name it. Uh, you breathe it every day. And being part of this transformation of the national airline, which is an integral part, an integral pillar of what the Crown Prince has in mind with his Vision 2030, is on one side the big challenge, but more interesting and more uh, satisfying to anybody is to be part of this uh, big challenge and to see what the airline can do. So yes, a sleeping giant, uh, I think it's not sleeping anymore, it has woken up. Uh, you just mentioned the most improved airline last year. We have added uh, 62 new aircraft over the last two years. We'll receive an additional 18 aircraft this year. We are investing massively into the fleet, but more importantly, into our people. We are retraining 8,000 uh, frontline staff on the ground, on the air. We are investing a lot on what our 16,000 employees uh, are doing and will be doing in the future to make sure that this giant is really awake, is really thriving, is really growing, and really putting the right place uh, in the Middle East uh, group of airlines where it really belongs. Okay. Um you're talking about, and, and I, I know it's difficult because um, you're not a Saudi national um, and Saudi is a government airline. So you talk about the transformation. One of the things I see is one of the hugest barriers, and I know I are to talk about taxation and government costs. Trying to come into Saudi Arabia, and, and as you walk down there, you'll see great big signs saying Saudi tourism beautiful things happening, an incredible country, but about 500 US dollars if you want to visit even for three days. You could fly to Australia, to Bali and get in for nothing. So is that transformation likely to lift the barriers to enable more people to travel to come to Saudi? Well, you, you said it, Snam. it's uh, needed, definitely needed. And the Crown Prince is driving all these uh, transformation initiatives. Uh, my daughter just visited us uh, from Germany and she spent almost one day to get an expensive visa with not the best attention uh, at the visa issuing station. So as a tourist, you would rather say perhaps there are more interesting uh, destinations where to spend some time. But it is part of this transformation. The, we have just been uh, open, uh, the government has just been opening up the rules to get a tourist visa, the rules to get a uh, stopover visa. There is a new market which is being explored and the visa is only part of this. It is the whole ecosystem in civil aviation that is going through a massive transformation. The government is investing billions in the new terminal in Jena. They are investing in the infrastructure locally, domestically on the 27 airports that we operate on the regional market. They are promoting local competition, domestic competition. They are upgrading many initiatives from the authority, from GACA, from the Civil Aviation Authority. So as a person that has worked for more than 40 years in the industry, I really see massive changes, but not only in the airline, what we can do and what we should do, but the whole ecosystem, how this is being upgraded, how this is being prepared to really play an important role, not only in the year 2030 with implementation of the vision, but on the road to that. 
as a foreigner, it is a challenge, yes. Uh, definitely, you have to understand, you have to respect the culture. Uh, fortunately, I had my 11 years in Star Alliance, uh, dealing with many, many cultures around the world, with 27 cultures, finally, to try to respect, to understand, try to integrate yourself into where you are. And uh, at the end of the day, it's a really fascinating experience. Yeah? And I guess, as a foreigner, the way I understand my role is that uh, we bring in a little bit from outside experience, something which perhaps has been uh, limited to the Saudi colleagues uh, because of having focused on the domestic market. And I'm sure that this combination of the expertise from the Saudi colleagues, for me to understand the dynamics of the market, to understand the locals, to understand the culture, with the outside in view, with the outside in experience, uh, I think it's a good teamwork that uh, will get the airline to new heights. Because to me, that was actually kind of a part of that transformation. And to get that relationship of inside outside, which hadn't been with the national carrier before. Right. And it's a, I understand my job is a, for as long as I will be in Saudi Arabia to lead the airline, transform the airline, drive to transformation, but more importantly, to prepare the Saudis yeah, to take over. There is a lot of talent, yeah? a lot of, of talent so. within the airline, a lot of talent in the country, a lot of investment also from the government in education. The government is supporting more than 5,000 Saudis every year to study abroad, mainly in the United States, in the United Kingdom. So these are young people, yeah? the new generation, the talented people that come with a great academic background. They integrate in the airline. We have a pioneer program running in the company. And uh, this is the management of the future. This is the next generation where hopefully we can play a role in supporting them and preparing them and taking over the lead for a great, successful uh, giant. Okay. I'm going to move on to a bit now because it was quite interesting walking along the center aisle there and seeing the huge Emirates, uh, the huge Etihad. Um, and you've got one that's actually pretty much the same size, which to me suggests that's where your aspirations lie in terms of reputation as well as actual physical size. Now, we've seen Emirates Etihad, Qatar Airways um, suffer in the United States because of their relationship with their government and their support from the government, the investment from the government. Saudi flies to the US and so on. How do you see that kind of relationship if, when you do grow to suddenly face the anti-competitiveness of the US protectionist market? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, when you always speak about the three big golf carriers, huh? what position and where does Saudi fit? The business model of Saudi and the future of Saudi is different than uh, the business model of any one of the three big carriers. They developed an efficient uh, business model based on a hub system in Dubai. If you remember Dubai 20, 30 years ago, yeah? uh, Emirates was basically a small airline. The airport was not a hub. Same thing in Abu Dhabi. Even, I have to say, same thing in Istanbul. Uh, we are not trying to copy that uh, business model. Yeah? Saudi is different, uh, number one. We are different because we have a huge domestic market. We have 27 domestic airports. Uh, most of them are international airports. We have a huge domestic market. We board about 17 million passengers every year. Saudis flying in the country, a country which has a still to be developed railroad system, a ground transportation system. So flying is part of the Saudi life. So that's totally different from what you see with the other carriers. Number two, Saudi Arabia is the country of the two holy mosques. Uh, the 1.8 billion Muslims, they perform their pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. For anybody, it's easier, it's much more efficient to go on a non-stop flight to Mecca, to Medina, than to have a stopover in any other part of the world. So this is a totally different market that we are now targeting, where I have to say Saudi was below the fair market share on the religious traffic. We started the initiative uh, beginning of last year, and I have to say that we grew massively, much higher than the market. Yes, because we're doing something right, and secondly, because it's a much better product. So mm -hmm. this is totally different from what the other golf carriers are doing. And with the opening of the new Jeddah terminal at the end of 2018, we will be able yeah, to gather some sixth uh, freedom traffic. Uh, basically, this mm, basis, one of the pillars of the other golf carriers, we do not aspire to have a 50, 60, 70% uh, uh, connecting traffic. We don't need it 
fortunately. Yeah? It's nice to grow, it's nice to fill empty seats that we still have today, and it will be part of a business model, but it will not be the prime pillar of a business model. So it's a different business model that we're entertaining. If you ask the United States, yes, we fly to three destinations in the US, one in um, um, Canada. We were affected as the other carriers were, but our exposure yeah, to these destinations was much more limited. So I guess here is where we also can see a big difference between the big exposure and the damage uh, that this uh, limit, this ban on the computers did to the other Gulf carriers versus the negative impact we had in Saudi. Okay. It was manageable. And finally on that point, um, open skies and Saudi, what's the, uh, what's the position there? Well, that's a government uh, position. I know the government, as part of the ecosystem, is opening up. Uh, I know that they are negotiating with many countries uh, for new bilateral deals. Uh, if it goes open skies, yes, uh, there are open skies with some countries. If it goes a full open sky, it depends on the government policy. It's all about competition. And from the airline point of view, what is important, uh, whatever the government decides uh, for, for open skies, you have to be prepared as an airline to cope with open skies. Uh, same history we had in Mexico. The Mexican carriers were tiny compared to the huge North American carriers. And if it, uh, 30 years, 20 years ago, the government would have gone for open skies, it would have been the death for the Mexican carriers. You are just not prepared to compete against the monsters. But uh, Saudi Arabia and with Saudi now where we are, I think we are pretty well prepared yeah, to fight an open skies uh, competition uh, to get a fair market share. Okay, thank you. Sanjay, I've talked to you about the competition, really, from the Gulf, the um, busy markets, and there's a lot of um, Indian nationals that are living throughout the Gulf, and the Gulf carriers have huge, great reputations. Do you see them as a threat, or do you see them as an opportunity? So basically, from Indigo's point of view, it's a totally different market. We don't see any threat as far as Gulf carriers are concerned. They are basically carrying the traffic from India and Pakistan and Indian subcontinent into their hubs and then carrying it to Europe and to US. That is the market we are not even in at this point of time. So we really don't see them as a thread. We are purely a point to point traffic uh, between India and Middle East at this point of time. And we see with our huge domestic presence in the marketplace, uh, wherein not only we have the connectivity from larger cities into middle, this part of the world, but also in the cities like Cochin and then South India cities, uh, many of the flights coming directly into this part of the world and providing connectivity to the Indian diaspora. So what we're saying is that we are a domestic airline expanding into international market. And with our strength of our domestic network, I think we will be able to kind of do a better job as compared to any other airlines, which are largely depending on the through traffic and the traffic to either Europe or to other part of the world. So that is one thing. Second thing is, of course, uh, we have a huge domestic network presence and which is becoming very, very important for us to kind of do the feed in into our own network. Right now, we don't have any code share or any alliances with any other, other airline, primarily because we think that if we have been able to kind of expand our operations into other part of the world, we will be able to take uh, connectivity into domestic to this network of Indigo itself. And that is what is kind of working very well for us at this point in time. And that's why we don't see this um, carriers from Gulf or other part of uh, Southeast Asia as a threat to Indigo. We, we have a huge population in India, 1.2 billion people, and those are the people who are kind of, you know, wanting to travel outside for one reason or the other. Uh, given the kind of uh, connectivity which Indigo is creating domestically as also internationally, they will be able to kind of do more frequent travelers because uh, the fares are low, uh, the flights are on time, and the network is great. So these are the th basic things which we are trying to bring to the table of Indian po population. And we are quite sure that as we grow our business, we'll be able to kind of deal with this competition in much more effective way than whatever we have so far done. Okay, I'm gonna pick up on one of the, a figure you just used then. 1.2 billion people yeah. domestically yeah. living in India, which is about four times that of the United States. Yeah. If you look at the size of the United States air market, then you know, you've only got to go to Atlanta to watch the number of aircraft yeah. coming in every minute. Do you see India having that same potential or, or are there barriers to the kind of internal market? So this is our own kind of belief uh, at Indigo that we are sitting on a huge massive opportunity at this point of time. Uh, as you rightly said, 1.2 billion people and only 500 commercial planes uh, serving the entire country. 
uh, compared with the uh, US about 250, 300 million people and more than 7,000 commercial plane flying in the country. So you can create, you can clearly see the difference and uh, Leopard US and uh, you know other European countries which are much more developed, even if the countries like uh, China and uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, they have much higher aircraft penetration that uh, compared to India. So we have a huge run ahead of us for next 20 years, 30 years. Airbus and Boeing are forecasting that India will become by 2030 the largest aviation market in the world. And they are expecting that the growth to be about 10 to 12 percent year on year basis till about 2035. And this is not our forecast. This is the forecast of these uh, giant companies, Airbus and uh, Boeing. Uh, so we, we believe that India is just on the threshold of uh, this massive growth. Last 30, 30 months, last uh, three years, we have seen a growth of over 20% in the domestic traffic uh, on month-on-month -month basis, and that has never been so, so high. So we are seeing that Indians, given a, if you are able to create this capacity in the market, you are able to offer the connectivity, you are able to offer lower fare, there is you know, immense opportunity for the growth, and that is what we are kind of working on. And we are quite sure that in next, uh, you know, couple of years, India will become the one of the fastest growing market in the world, and will become the largest aviation market in the world by 2030. Okay, your, your government last year introduced, um, or the year before, introduced its um, civil aviation thing. How much is the government going to help you with that? The, you know, infrastructure is it in place? Have you got enough airports to service? what you have so, as an opportunity. So in, in India, you know, it's fair to say that everything is late started. Uh, you know, until you have the traffic jam on the roads, the roads will not be built up. Until you have the massive congestion in the airport, uh, the, you know, airport infrastructure will not improve up. And it's fair to say between last 10 years, we have seen uh, this privatization of the airports in Delhi, Bombay, uh, Bangalore, and Hyderabad. And those airports are world-class airport. Recently, Delhi airport has been awarded the, you know, the world's best airport in 40 million category, uh, 40 million passenger category. So what we're saying is that the infrastructure is improving. Uh, with that, uh, Airport Authority of India, which controls the government-owned airport in the country, they are making massive investment into secondary airport and tertiary airport. The national civil aviation policy, which you talked about, uh, the government of India has come out with its regional connectivity program uh, over the last two years, and we are seeing the benefit of that scheme coming in a big way. And Indigo itself has kind of placed the order for ATR operation just to take the advantage of this regional growth which is happening massively in the marketplace. Uh, so we are seeing infrastructure and all the bottlenecks kind of getting settled. It has not settled fully. It is not settled that we would ideally want them to be, but in a calculated way, in a slower way, it is kind of coming up. Infrastructure is coming up. Now we are building up second airport in Bombay, second airport in Delhi, and also the second runway in Bangalore and Hyderabad is in the process. So we are seeing a lot of improvement in the infrastructure as this massive growth is kind of coming in. We are quite sure that government and all other stakeholders over the next couple of years' time will be able to kind of create that infrastructure which is required to manage this massive growth which is going to happen in India uh, over the next 10, 20, 30 years. First point is to, to meet that massive growth, you need more, more aircraft. Um, you've got your six ATRs and yes. 155 yes. A320s at the moment. You've got to need more than that. You've got to need more ATRs, I guess, and more Airbus. Yeah. When are you going to order some more? So we, we already have uh, um, about uh, 398 aircraft on order, Airbus 320 Neos, and, uh, if, and, and 50 ATR on order. So we have about 450 planes on order to be delivered to Indigo over the next couple of years' time. And uh, as we expand our business, should the business require more, obviously, shareholders and the board will take a call accordingly. And the, the other part of that question really is, who's going to fly them, who's going to maintain them, and who's going to serve the passengers in the back? So, Where are you getting them from? Because there's a shortage coming. So, you know, again, as I mentioned that when Indigo launched about 10 years, 11 years back, there were much more shortage than what it is today. And uh, I, I, because we knew our business plan, we knew that growth opportunities which are coming on the way, we had kind of started our credit pallet program. And we kind of started developing this program uh, in 2007. And as a result, today we are producing every month about 25 uh, commanders and about 25 co-pilots for our Airbus fleet. And that 
they have over a period of time, last several years, have been able to kind of develop that program. So we have a problem. We have to work around the solution around those problems. And we have been able to find out a solution around those problems. So pilots are not a problem for us. Training our own manpower for our other specialized job is not a problem. And if we have an issue anywhere, of course, we bring the talent from overseas in order to be able to kind of, you know, work with that local team and train them accordingly so that we, they come out better in terms of mass, managing these massive operations and massive growth at the company. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and we, we, we saw at, um, Emirates announce recently that they were dropping some routes in the summer because they haven't got enough people to handle that. Is that affecting you yet? And how do you see a program like we saw from Sanjay talking about 10 years ago preparing for this. How is Saudi positioned? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess this is another uh, big difference between the other Gulf carriers and Saudi because Saudi Arabia has a population of 32 million people. So our pilots are mainly locals. Uh, the, the population in Saudi Arabia is young. They are thriving. Uh, they are well educated. Uh, so the main base for our growth will be Saudi pilots. Uh, we have an important number of experts. Uh, they still come from the previous years, from the past years, uh, where there was a combination of expert pilots together with locals. But uh, I think we are blessed to be able to say that this should not be a reason for Saudi Arabia not to be able to continue expanding. Right? We have this population. We are investing in uh, cadets, uh, Saudi Arabia in itself. The government are investing in preparing the next generation of pilots. So fortunately, now this is an area where Saudi is again different from the limitations, uh, the constraints that uh, some other, particularly the Gulf carriers have. And another uh, good uh, advantage for us is that if you are not so dependent on foreign pilots, uh, your salary structure, your compensation structure uh, is also more efficient because you don't have to offer these expensive uh, expat packages uh, to mainly, I don't know what percentages of expat pilots you see in the other Gulf carriers, but uh, it must be expensive. Uh, so it's a one advantage that we have in the, in the carrier to be able to have a talented, well-educated, well-prepared, well-trained uh, pool of locals. Same is true for flight attendants. Uh, we still have a very big uh, proportion of female flight attendants. It's also part of this uh, cultural change that the uh, country is going through. So I do foresee uh, a big change there as well, yeah, to be able to have Saudi females uh, on board the aircraft. Huh? It's a personal guess, yeah, but I think it's coming. And this is, opens the door to many young uh, women as well, not to be able to um, work in such an environment. And I believe that Saudi, the new training um, college is promoting to female pilots in Saudi as well. So not only driving cars, but continuing to drive, uh, fly aircraft. I think we've had Saudi women pilots, but just not able to get to the airport before. Right, yeah, so a nice combination now of the transformation of the big cultural change happening in the country with uh, the differences now because of this huge local, I mean, again, 32 million Saudis. Yeah? This is, an, and young, uh, this is a very, very young population. Yeah? Uh, so this gives you ample opportunities for the airline to look for talent. Okay. Sanjay was talking about the huge domestic market that exists in India. There has been a huge focus on the domestic deregulation in Saudi. You've now kind of entered the market with your own low-cost carrier to do that. Can you just talk through the reasons behind that when there was already enough fight going on about whether there should be domestic carriers at all in Saudi? NAS, um, Fly NAS has been doing a decent enough job um, as well. So why come in with a low-cost carrier? Yeah, good question, and uh, it was a very well thought over decision. Um, months and months of analysis, months and months of pros and cons. And uh, now, what is it, eight months after the launch, the successful launch of the first flights of Flyer Deal, I have to say that the effect is just fantastic for the for Saudi, for the for the legacy company, in two ways. That we as Saudi, because of our cost structure, would find it very hard to be able to compete on the price, because of our cost structure, to compete on the same pricing as the ever-growing number of local Saudi low-cost carriers. So try to do that. We tried it in Mexico, we tried it in many other countries. It does not necessarily work. Yeah? If you cannot lower your cost base at the same pace to be able to offer cheap tickets, you are in deep trouble. So that was the number one reason. But perhaps most importantly for Saudi, for the employees, even for the management, is that we learned and we are learning every day from Flyer Deal. 
because here we are in Saudi at a legacy airline at its best. A network airline, a proud airline, an airline with a lot of tradition, with a long history, 73 years uh, in the market. But uh, you also have the negative sides of legacy, yeah? being, uh, being what you are. So try to change that. Yeah? If you don't get a leading light, if you don't get the experience, if you don't get the push from others how to do it, yeah? it's going to take a long time. So we are seeing that Flyer Deal is negotiating with the vendors at a different pace. They are getting different contracts. They are getting different deals. And this has opened the eyes, has opened the attention of many of the Saudi Arabian, of the Saudi managers, that uh, yes, things can be done differently and things need to be done differently. So we are benefiting yeah, from a startup, from a low cost, from a newcomer, from a greenfield approach. Yeah, to not to deal at all yeah, with the legacy concepts that we are dealing with. Yeah. So this is basically at the end of these six, eight months of them having been in the market has been a great factor yeah, in speeding up our transformation process. Yeah. So there is a different way to do it. So already you're seeing signs of a cultural change because we've seen it with British Airways, we've seen it with American airlines that have got this kind of, I, let's say arrogance almost within the attitude towards customer service. Change is desperately important. Are you seeing change in the whole, across the whole company? Definitely changes in the way we deal with the customers, changes the way we fly, the daily utilization of the aircraft. I mean, there are so many things here yeah, that we as legacy carriers have learned and can learn and will continue learning from what the locust carriers have done. Yeah, there are many, many aspects and it. Uh, the bundled fares or debundling fares uh, offering uh, from the pas uh, passenger point of view, offering the different packages, offering the different opportunities, what does the passenger want? So the, the, the expansion of the low-cost carriers all over the world has really opened the door, has put the customer in the center. Yeah? And we as legacy carriers, unfortunately, yeah? but uh, ah, it's, it's better than to be late and never to do it. Yeah? We are following this model. Okay. But uh, again, more importantly, I would say, is the attitude and management. Yeah? But particularly coming from a legacy carrier, yeah, where you thought that your future was in the company, that you had the job forever, that uh, you would just continue getting up the ladder. If you see the dynamics that have gone into management when they negotiate, when they approach the authorities, the way they deal, the way they go on marketing, the way they promote the airline, these are big learnings uh, for management uh, throughout the company, uh, particularly from a carrier like Saudi Arabia. Brilliant. I just want to check, are there there's any comments about our staff shortages, our domestic markets at all? In which case, no, good. In which case, I'm going to turn back to you then, Kuma, because Adel Ali, Air Arabia, um, stood up last week and said, I don't know why people even think they want to fly on, on full service carriers. People actually want the lowest price, the option they want, and to fly. And now we're seeing low-cost carriers actually taking on the full-service carriers by starting to do long-haul flights, our Air Asia X and so on. What's your view about the long-haul low-cost carrier? No frills, just get there. So we, we at Indigo has kind of uh, publicly stated, our shareholders have publicly stated that we want to go long-haul and we kind of started preparing ourselves for going a long-haul. But in terms of the product definition and the what kind of uh, you know product construct we'll have, still we we'll have some time to go ahead with that. Yeah, a lot of internal discussions are happening, so we'll not be able to comment on that at this point in time. But fair to say that we are going to go long haul for sure. And uh, you know, from India to Europe, we have already got the traffic rights approved by the Ministry of uh, Civil Aviation in India, and it's just a kind of matter of time. Uh, you know, we'll go long haul. But in what shape, what form, what product, what construct, that is still a matter of debate and a kind of discussion internally going on at this point of time. Okay. We saw Norwegian doing very well um, breaking the mold yeah. in Europe. And what's going to happen? IAG are going to buy them. Yeah. So are you putting yourself at risk that, in fact, rather than you buying Air India, which has been muted quite a few times, uh, Will it come the other way that someone's going to buy you because you're so successful in the uh, So, you know, I, again, we'll go back to the basics of business. Uh, we believe that uh, domestic India market uh, presents a great opportunity for this long haul flying uh, for Indigo. And that's what we are looking at at this point of time. We are not dependent on third, some third country's traffic or second country's traffic 
to flow into the international network. It is our own network which can, can service that uh, traffic which is flowing into via Dubai and via other markets uh, in a big way into other part of the world. So we are not overly concerned about that aspect at all. And uh, we believe that if we execute well, if we plan and execute well, I think there is a success there as well. Okay. Virgin Atlantic, as an example, are now talking about having four classes below business. So you're going to get a basic basic to take on the low costs. Do you see Saudia doing that or do you see that Flyer Deal could actually compete on routes with you but without any frills at all? Well, so Flyer Deal for the time being is focused on the domestic market. Uh, they will expand gradually with a single aisle aircraft with a 320 or with a new order with a 737. They will expand, but uh, within a radius, a uh, short haul, medium haul radius uh, around, uh, around the kingdom. So, yes, Saudia will have a product, has a product actually, which can compete on the economy class. Uh, same as Flyer Deal, we offer the same fares. Uh, the product uh, somehow is similar. But then, uh, fortunately, there is a market for everybody. Yeah? So, uh, fortunately, now there is always a yeah, business class passenger. Uh, there is the government traffic. Uh, there is uh, all the different segments. Yeah? And this is where Saudi has been good and where Saudi will be even better going forward. Then, of course, you have the long haul flights, uh, which is almost half of our product yeah, from Saudi. We have uh, from our fleet about half is short haul, half is long haul. We fly to the US, to Europe, and South Africa, to the Far East. So there is, a, again, a combination of even business class a, a, and first class product, particularly to North America, to Europe, no, where you have a, a specific market for that. Uh, we will continue flying with our two hubs, a, out of Riyadh, out of Jeddah. There is a big a government traffic uh, both ways, particularly to the West. Yeah? So this is a good reason, a good business traffic uh, for your high-end uh, customers. And then, uh, of course, uh, we have to cater for the pilgrims, uh, a specific uh, bi uh, a product for the pilgrims. We took away uh, eight seats on the 777s for a prayer area on both the aircraft uh, and the back of the aircraft. So these are unique things no, where you cannot say, uh, we do not want to compare ourselves with anybody else. This is very unique, very specific for the kind of traffic that we are moving, for the kind of traffic that is today visiting and generating out of the kingdom. Uh, in addition, not to the six freedom traffic that we aspire now with the new terminal. So I would say uh, you have to have a specific, uh, either on a niche, which we have with the pilgrim traffic, we have a certain niche with the domestic traffic, yeah, which is again uh, not accessible to the other golf carriers. And you have to try to understand what the customer really wants and decide on the different product, on a niche product or a specific product, to hopefully cater for the interest of the different segments in the population. And I tell you what, I see the segmentation in Saudi Arabia yeah, of the locals is very big. Yeah? So you have a market, I would say, for, for everybody. And this is what we are trying to redesign in Saudi Arabia to cater for everybody's needs. Because that's quite interesting. If we look, at, and I'm, I'm going to move on really to passenger experience in a moment, but the whole thing about the millennial managers now, um, because these millennials are, are moving through, and, I, and some of the research that was produced yesterday was saying that they're actually looking at things differently. They're, they're spending more time traveling after they've done their business trip. They're less worried about, I don't know, the, the big seats and things, about, rather than getting there and being able to move on and being able to connect. How are you looking at IFE connectivity and actually using the big data from the knowledge of your customers to get into those niches? Yeah. Yes, a good, good question. And uh, this is a big area of investment. It's one of our big projects that we are running in the airline. Uh, big data, digitalization. Uh, surprising to me, uh, I learned that Saudi Arabia is one of the countries with the highest penetration on, mo on mobility, on mobile phones. It's a population with the highest number of mobile phones per per person in, in Saudi Arabia. So uh, if you look at the streets everywhere you are, yeah, people just uh, following following their phones. Yeah? So this is a big opportunity for the airline. We have invested in the IFE, number one, uh, to, to have a uh, fleet-wide, short-haul, long-haul IFE. We're investing in digitalization. We're investing in learning the customers and making use of this uh, need and this uh, starting point from the Saudi population that they are mobile, they are very well connected. Yeah? And this is, again, a big opportunity for the airline uh, going forward. Great. In fact, it's quite interesting because Fly Ness, I believe, was the first airline to get to one million followers on Twitter. 
mm. um, which is an indication of the huge Saudi interest in that. Yeah. With that IFE, <coughs> excuse me, you're going, you're almost going on your own there, aren't you? Because I think Saudi is developing its own um, satellites and, and IFE systems, and, and Saudi is launching it. Well, a combination, yeah. So uh, we don't want to reinvent the world. We just uh, implemented this uh, agreement. Uh, the, the first aircraft was refurbished, a collaboration partnership with DACNIA. So to have state-of-the-art uh, worldwide connectivity on our short haul, on our longer fleet, we will have 19 aircraft ready by the end of the year. So yes, it's uh, driven by Saudi, but of course with a technology partner, yeah? not to not to try to do what the uh, other companies, uh, I would say, better prepared or with more experience or with more uh, money for research and development uh, that are available to do that. So it's a great partnership. It's just uh, starting. You now the first aircraft is flying, and uh, we have uh, big hopes yeah, that this will be a big, big success for the company. And it works. And it works, of <laughs> course. <laughs> well, that's different then. Yeah. <laughs> Sandy, what, what about you? I mean, you're low cost. Have you thought about the, the connectivities in IFE? Side? So we kind of, uh, our basic principle is keep your cost low and uh, make your customer pay for what they want to kind of avail. And uh, with that objective, we are kind of uh, focused in terms of creating our product. Uh, but we have really not gone in terms of, uh, you know, connectivity on the plane, primarily because it's going to increase your cost. And then customers are not go going to be pay for it. Uh, in India, we've seen that uh, if you offer it free of cost, it makes sense. People will be loving it. But if you want to charge 100 rupees or 200 rupees uh, per time uses for a two-hour flight, then there will be very few takers. So, uh, you know, rather than creating it a cost item in our uh, line of business, we want to make sure whatever we do is become a revenue item, revenue opportunity for us. And with that lens, we look at any other kind of product enhancement or opportunities. And in that filter, this in-flight uh, you know, connectivity doesn't really matter to us at this point of time, and we are not looking at that at all. Long haul? Uh, long haul, again, as I said, that uh, it's kind of too early for any comment to make right now, and uh, it will kind of depend over next, uh, I think, six months, uh, six weeks to eight weeks' time, we'll have some more clarity on the product and other stuff uh, going long haul. Okay, so um, the other point on that was the use of things, social media for example, the relationships you hold with, with your customers. It's, it's, it's odd, isn't it, that people expect things on an airline that they wouldn't expect on a train or a bus or yeah. something. How are you dealing with that? How, are, are you adopting social media as a key strategy? Yeah, so of course, social media has been uh, part of the key strategy for Indigo. And uh, we, in fact, uh, have our you know social media teams operating under our operations control center as a part of the operating control center so that anything which is coming on the social media uh, related to our operation, customer issues, complaints, or any baggage handling issues can be straight away given answer based on the actual operations of the aircraft. And uh, that is one thing we have kind of done very well. And uh, uh, over the last uh, couple of years now, we have been kind of awarded uh, the best uh, Twitter kind of social media handling as far as Indigo is concerned. We have been ranked number one in the world in terms of the Twitter response. If you file a complaint or uh, you know try to seek some attention, within uh, 16 seconds or something, we kind of, our team get back to you uh, on our social media platform. So what we have done is uh, we are using social media, uh, primarily Twitter, Instagram, and uh, Facebook, uh, to reach out to the customer, to address their issues, to address their queries, and of course, in a big way, using some data in order to kind of reach out to the different segment of the customers through these channels uh, in order to kind of yeah. improve our business and marketing and uh, sales promotions. So we are doing that quite effectively at this point of time. Well, interestingly, I, I saw last week or whatever it was, you almost had a United Air Airlines yeah. moment um, with the passenger on board with the mosquito. Yeah, that's um, right. Now, that was dealt with in 16 seconds, was yeah. it, or something, when yeah. all of that kicked so, off? So, you know, uh, again, I mean, those are the kind of very peculiar issues which come uh, in, a, in our environment. And, of course, uh, we being in the electronic media, we have different challenges managing those. But, uh, yes, uh, in terms of response to the customer, response to the queries on the, through the social media, we do make sure that, you know, that there is kind of uh, regular 
uh, and very quick response to the query of the customer and to the response to the customer. Even if it is kind of not getting sorted out, I mean, if the planes, uh, there are mosquitoes, you cannot, you don't want to delay the plane from departing and uh, while kind of cleaning it up, you know, you know this is bad weather in uh, northern India at this point of time, uh, very hot summer, and uh, one day of rain brings a lot of mosquitoes in there. So that's kind of part of the nature. We just can't fight the nature at this point of time. But in terms of using social media, we are kind of using it many fold, uh, not only uh, in terms of issuing, uh, the, the, addressing the issues of the customers, but also doing a relationship building, you know, reaching out customers' birthdays and uh, anniversaries and uh, some special celebrations of the plane. Uh, in addition to that, we are also using social media in a very, very effective way for doing a sales and marketing promotions uh, of various kind, uh, promoting our destination, promoting our holiday programs in a very, very effective way. So we are, we are quite effectively using the social media at this point of time. Great, thank you. Yeah, and what about yourself? Do you, do you use social media as well to, for promotion or to fight fires? For everything, uh, actually, we have some colleagues here that are in the room that are managing our social media uh, group. Uh, so, yeah, it's one of the big changes of the big, uh, I would say, revolution even in the airline industry. Uh, some years ago, social media, I mean, it was a, a chat for the young people uh, to communicate amongst them. And today, the way this has evolved in the airline industry is just fascinating. Uh, so either you are part of it, uh, you try to drive, you try to lead in certain areas, or you will be losing market share, you will be out of the game. Yeah? So no discussion, no, it's a absolutely part of the game, a big, big change like internet, no? when we changed the, the, booking, uh, the booking channels uh, today, the way we communicate with the customers, we learn from them. Uh, I was uh, many, many years ago, I was in the accident investigation group, and years ago, 30, 40 years ago, when there was an incident, an accident, uh, we tried to quickly cover the logo of the airline. Yeah? So for no pictures to be taken, oh, yes, there is a, an aircraft in the grass somewhere, but try to cover the logo. Today, yeah, if you have an incident, accident, uh, passengers just come up, they turn around, and they see how the people are still uh, jumping on the, on the chutes. Yeah? So uh, it's all about openness. Yeah? It's about speed. Yeah? You have to be connected. No? It's just an example to say, the way we dealt in this industry years ago, decades ago, is just not acceptable the way we're going forward on this. Yeah. So it's all about transparency, about speed, and try to anticipate you know, what the customers, I mean, we saw all these examples, say what happened in other airlines in North America, how damaging this can be to the airline. Yeah? If you don't react, if you don't have a team in the airline, if you are not prepared to deal with these uh, sudden negative, uh, because that's normally what happens. Yeah? If there is any event or something negative, it's immediately yeah, available to the rest of the world. And if you don't have an organization, if you're not prepared, if you don't have the procedures, the processes, uh, the people to deal with this uh, as an airline, you can be very quickly in very deep trouble. Yeah? So, and again, here you have a country uh, where the mobility, where the use of the mobile phones is extremely widely spread, yeah? so, which makes it easy uh, from the side for the airline to have the people to look for this. On the other side, it makes it tricky yeah? because you know that everybody is connected and everybody will speak and write whatever they see. And of course, the challenge within the airline is empowerment of the person in the middle of the night that's monitoring Twitter because a global operation like yours, something's going to happen at 2 a.m. in the morning. Right. It never happens when everybody's in, same as accidents, they don't happen when everybody's in the office, the yeah. you know, weekends yeah. in a way. Right. We as airlines, traditionally, we had our crisis team. Huh? We were prepared, they got forbid, yeah, but if you have any major incident or so. Today, really, the crisis team yeah, has changed to a social media team. Yeah? That uh, you never know when something is going to happen. It doesn't have to be a major incident or accident. It can be just, I mean, like what happened in North America. Huh? Smaller things now that mm. go immediately viral, and if you are not prepared for that, you will deal uh, a long time uh, with this to try yeah. to recover your image. If we look into the future, we're talking about Dubai, and there was a thing yesterday, you know, the, the air taxes and Hyperloop. And so where do you see the airline industry going in the future? Are we going to benefit? from some of these technologies, the biometrics that can get us on the aircraft without having to mess around getting passports stamped and so on. Are we going to exist because Hyperloop is going to cut out Jeddah and Riyadh, um, you know, so there's one of your big markets. How do you see all that new disruptive technologies affecting aviation? Mm. Well, disruptive technologies, I don't think they are disruptive. Uh, they are modern technologies. These are technologies that will take time. Just look how the, the, the car industry, how many years, if not decades, 
is it taking to really make a change from fossil engines yeah, to electric engines? Mm. It's, a, it's very bumpy, but it's taking many, many years. In the airline industry, it's much more complex. Uh, so I guess when we speak about the future, we have to define what is the future. Right? Uh, will something meaningful uh, happen, disruptive happen in the, in the airline industry because of these technologies? Uh, I don't see this happening in five or in 10 years. Just look back 10 years. What happened in the last 10 years in this industry? Today we have 380s flying. That might have been perhaps the most disruptive uh, uh, element in our industry. But uh, uh, from five years and 10, perhaps even 15 years, yeah, will there be electrical engines yeah, to allow uh, airlines with uh, 200, 300 people to fly through the skies? I don't see this. Uh, it's a matter also of investment. It's a matter of uh, how, how viable is this? Yeah? How, how uh, is it possible from the investment point of view? No? We are still ordering the order books for Airbus and for Boeing are full for the next 10, 15 years. Yeah? So I think the, the technologies and the application of these modern technologies will happen more on the ground, will happen more on the efficiency of the kind of aviation we do today. We just spoke about social media, we yeah. spoke about the internet, we're speaking about uh, biometric airports. Uh, another example, biometric airports. Uh, how many years ago uh, was there a biometric passport in some countries? Yeah? And what have we in the airline industry that would immensely benefit yeah, from a worldwide use of biometric uh, identification, biometric passports, biometric uh, ease of the flow through the airports? Yeah? We're far away, yeah? far away from that. Technology is available. But uh, countries not always yeah, get uh, excited about these technologies. Uh, politics play a big uh, role. Uh, the harmonization, yeah, to have a single product. Uh, I remember my years in Star Alliance where several of our leading members already had uh, uh, chips for the baggage identification yeah? uh, or the biometric uh, passport, biometric uh, check-in at the gates. Yeah? But uh, even in a group of carriers, yeah, it was very difficult to align the expectations. My technology is better as yours. No, mine is better as the third one. So, uh, uh, and this is an airline environment. Yeah? So if you try to bring this together from the government point of view, it's going to be a big challenge. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that I don't think there will be any major disruptive technology. Uh, disrupting our business, yeah, it will be a gradual evolution. But application of some of the things we have, if we, we go back to the big data point, um, it seems to me that the airline industry sometimes is a bit behind in terms of application of digitalization. Uh, I mean, it was only two weeks ago that you get organizations like Gate who do so much of the food stuff finding out that if you use big data, you can actually predict which meals you actually need on board, can therefore save 50% of the food wastage that goes on, which is millions of tonnes a year from the airline industry, and also saves millions of dollars of not having to buy food that you're never going to use. So where do we get into growing into the 21st century? Yeah, no, that's, that's a, definitely a, one of the areas where I see big benefit for the industry, yeah? big benefit for the world. Yeah? Uh, to use these technologies, you call it disruptive technologies, I call them forward-looking technologies, or the next step of the evolution, yeah? making use of, a, of a, the digital a transformation, digital revolution yeah? mm -hmm. that is basically happening every day. But uh, it is, in a way, for us airlines to be on top of things, yeah? to make use of these technologies. Yeah? The sooner you do it, the better. It's also a matter of investment. Uh, look, this, this industry is a very vulnerable industry. You depend on oil prices, on geopolitical events, on SARS many years ago. You depend on so many external factors. Yeah? On the other side, so the, the risk is very high. Yeah? On the other side, it is so intensive. Yeah? If you make an investment today, if uh, like the, friendly, uh, the, the colleagues from India, if you invest in 300 new aircraft, it's a multi-billion investment. Yeah? And you will decide, you decide on this investment today for aircraft that you will probably be receiving in the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah? So where does the money go? Yeah? Where can you invest the money today in trying to balance this out on the very extremely uh, capital intensive industry? high risk because of external factors, yeah? always new competitors, yeah? always a new name of the game happening in the industry. On the other side, how much money and how much resources, natural human resources, can you invest in this kind of, uh, of evolution, of digital evolution? So for us airlines, it's really a matter of picking those uh, steps or that, that uh, kind of an evolution or that kind of new products that become available, picking it to see how can you balance this with your overall risk and with the overall need for, for investment on, a, on other badly needed things. I mean, an aircraft has a 20, 25 year life cycle. Yeah? 
uh, if you don't invest in this ex extremely expensive technologies, you are done. Yeah? So, okay. Sanjay, where do you see the future coming? Basically, the future is all about you know rationalization of the cost either through the disruption technology or innovation and making the customer experience much better than what it is today. Uh, bring in more efficiency, more productivity, so the less can do more and, uh, you know, uh, cost can be controlled. So as long as in every aspect of the airline business, uh, there are changes which are going to drive efficiency and productivity, bringing the cost down, and there where the future is. Uh, gone are the days when people are going to pay for uh, extra money because you know somebody is getting a wider seat or somebody is getting more leg space. Uh, people are focused in terms of saving money uh, at at any point of time, and uh, we have seen not only in India but also other part of the world uh, where people are more concerned about the cost savings and the uh, using that money in some other activities. And uh, so our, our view is my view, personal view is that. Uh, you know, as long as efficiency, productivity, and uh, better customer experience, uh, and also the cost uh, can be lowered by innovation, by bringing in better technology, uh, that will kind of help the cause of the aviation as a whole. Okay. And my final question is, what is it that wakes you up in the middle of the night? What is it that frightens you both so much that you sit up and think, this is the bit? Let's start with you. Start with him, and you can think. Thank God. <laughs> so, so you know, I I, I would say that uh, that all the flights are operating on time. Is there any message on the uh, WhatsApp or the groups? Yeah, I've seen your phone yeah. flicking up. Yeah. Every now yeah. and then. <laughs> so that is one. And second thing, of course, you know that everything across the network, uh, all colleagues, everybody is kind of kind of doing the job properly. That's it. Okay. I saw oil prices going up. That's good, isn't it, for you? <laughs> I was talking about uh, what's, what keeps us busy, what wakes you up. Uh, so in, in my case, in this airline, is to make sure that our staff, 16,000 people, understand the need for transformation. Uh, in a country yeah, where you have been benefiting from support, from a good relationship with the owners, with the government, with the with the Royal House, uh, you need to change. Uh, and this is now being driven at a tremendous speed yeah, by the Crown Prince. And what keeps me busy really, uh, how can we convince our people, our staff, 16,000 people that we have to change? It's not only about investing more money in new aircraft and in new technologies and in new infrastructure. It's all about the human side of the business. Yeah? We spoke about uh, uh, social media, etc. It's all about the customers. Yeah? It's the human side of the business. How can you deliver this? And the challenge we have in the, in the airline is to convince people yeah, that this does not come top down, yeah, but the real change in airline will come bottom up. But for that, yeah, you have to get a team, you have to get, in our case, 16,000 people to be convinced, not to smile because somebody ordered you to smile, yeah, but smile because you understood yeah, that this is good for the customer. Yeah? So this is the main topic that keeps me busy, keeps me thinking, how can we motivate uh, our, our people and, and really bond the fantastic team that we have. Excellent. Jan, Sanjay, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much.